to the second of a four-part webinar series titled Women on the Land. Uh, this is a webinar series being put on by the Forest Stewards Guild. My name is Olivia Lukasik and I'm going to be moderating this session today um, and I'm really excited that the Guild wanted to put on this webinar series. We've had um, a great session last week. Allison and Laura were talking about all things forest ecology and forest succession um, and today we are going to be taking kind of the next step forward and thinking about our woodlands uh, to creating a plan and working with a forester. So if you um, are newer to Zoom, um, I cannot advance my slide, so give me a second. If you are newer to Zoom, we wanted to just make sure you were good to go. So I'm just gonna put up a slide really quickly that shows kind of how to navigate. Oh, I'm back to this place. I apologize, everyone. Well, if in your Zoom screen on the, the lower bottom of your screen, you'll see a bunch of different commands. During the presentation today, if you could try to stay on mute, that would be ideal just so we can let our speakers have the full audio space, but you're welcome to have your video on or off. Um, you'll notice that this is a meeting setting. So at some point in the session, if you have a question at the end, you will be able to unmute yourself, but just keep in mind that background dogs or cats or other humans in your space um, become very audible to us all. And then in the upper right-hand corner, um, there's a little view button and you should be able to change from seeing just who is speaking to seeing the full gallery. So that can be nice as well um, as we navigate in our space. So today um, we're talking about the portion of a publication called Women on the Land. And so Women on the Land is a very new publication um, coming out of UMass and Michigan State. Uh, and it's great to have these events continue its momentum. So I was one of the researchers conducting a series of interviews actually with some of the folks on this call. Um, and we really talked to women foresters and women landowners about their experiences of just how they navigate being in their professions and also how they navigate um, making decisions about their woodlands, what's challenging, what's exciting for them. Um, and the real motivation behind this is we realized there weren't any outreach materials geared towards women landowners in the Eastern United States. So we wanted to create an easy to read, easy to understand booklet um, that was for women and about women and by women. And so um, I ended up interviewing over 42 people, which was phenomenal. And so a lot of their stories are in that um, publication, including some case studies of about seven women, and then also just lots of really great information to help you frame your thinking about being a woodland owner. So this week, we're really going to focus on uh, creating a plan of working with your woodlands. Um, and so in that publication, there's a flow chart that makes you think about active or versus passive management. Um, and so today we're going to hear from um, a landowner, Susie Feldman. We're going to be hearing from a uh, state forester and wildlife technician, Danny from Ohio. And we'll also be hearing from a consulting forester as well. So Leonora, if you could launch our polls, we just want to make sure we kind of know who's in the room today. So you should see something. Oh, sorry. I'm going to launch the polls. Um, you should see something pop up on your screen. We'd love to know your primary reason for joining today's webinar. And then also what part of the country are you zooming in from? Um, so just take a moment to click on your responses on your screen uh, and I will end the poll and also share those results in just a moment. But this is just a way for us to feel a little bit more like we're in a community space and not just a bunch of individuals from across the country um, on their computers. So I'm gonna give it just another moment. We have a couple more people that could vote and then I will share our results. So uh, most of you actually own land yourselves, about 52% of the people on the call own land. Um, and we also have a decent number of forestry professionals or natural resource professionals on the call, which is great. It's so great to hear your perspectives and also just kind of 
understand what's being talked about in these landowner circles. And then in terms of where we're coming from across the country, we have a strong representation from the Northeast, um, but it looks like we also have some, a lot of folks calling in from the Southeast today. So welcome to everyone. Um, the plan for today is we are first gonna hear from Danny, uh, and then we are gonna hear from Susie, and then we're gonna hear from Lori. Um, and at the end of this time, we'll have a, a question and answer and discussion section. But if you have questions that pop into your mind as we're going, feel free to put those in the chat and we will get to those as we can. Um, but Danny, if you wanna go ahead and get ready to start sharing, I'm gonna just read your bio. So Danny Gill works with the Hawking Soil and Water Conservation District as a wildlife specialist slash forester slash district technician um, in Hawking County, which is in Logan, Ohio. She loves teaching folks about the natural world around them and showing her young son and daughter the joys of nature. She is on the Ohio Forestry Advisory Council representing small landowners. And Danny and her husband own about 12 acres of land themselves and she assists her family in managing their 52 acre woodlot. So welcome Danny and you can take it away. Thank you, Olivia. Um, so as she said, you know, I, I have, I own some property myself, um, but why did I get into natural resources? That was something that I was asked. And as a small child, I was always out in the woods with my dad. He's pictured there in the middle. Um, we, my cousin and I had gone hiking in Colorado with him. So hanging out with him, I grew up hiking, fishing and hunting. Um, I enjoy the, I just enjoy nature and being able to be exposed to some of the lesser known plants like leatherwood or um, animals like the timber rattlesnake. Everybody has a, or many people have a fear of timber rattlesnakes, but I've actually worked hand in hand and been a few feet from rattlesnakes, not in tubes or anything like that. But, uh, um, and as I've gotten older, I now have, my daughter will be four in October and my son will be two in July. And I just enjoy sharing nature with them. So that's kind of why I got into it. Um, it is not a, oop, there we go. Are you seeing the soil and water conservation districts? Yes, looks great. Okay. okay. All right. So just a, a little bit about what soil and water conservation districts are. So we give technical assistance and education based help for public related for the public related to natural resources. Um, my position in, in particular, I give um, information related to forestry, wildlife, or agriculture. So as the district technician, I assist with um, our equipment rental and things like that also. Um, we give uh, programs for the general public and public and private school programs. Um, as Olivia said, I'm the wildlife specialist forester district technician. So me particularly, I do the ed I do some education, but most of mine is technical assistance. So I'll go on site visits and things like that to help identify plant or plants, um, animals or animal sign, um, non-native invasive species or wildlife damage um, with relation to crops um, and properties or visits to assist with management objectives such as um, a crop tree release and things like that. Um, so, uh, the Ohio Federation of Soil and Water Conservation Districts, Ohio, is fortunate because we're able to have a soil and water conservation district in all of our 88 counties. Now, I do know that that is a little bit different for some other states, like West Virginia, for instance. I know they have a... Um, a district that can cover two to three counties, but Ohio has one for every county. Um, and not every county in Ohio has a wildlife specialist forester. Um, some of them have one or the other, some don't have any, they just have folks on hand that have some knowledge related to forestry and wildlife, but Hawking has a, a dual position. Um, one of the things that we do, uh, we have a lot of partnerships. So a lot of the work we do, we're partnering uh, with 
agencies such as NRCS, Division of Forestry, uh, Division of Wildlife, which are both under the Department of Natural Resources, local extension, um, the local extension agencies and things like that. So some of the things that I do, um, are you able to see my mouse? Okay. So I go out and I inspect um, timber harvest plans uh, if they are submitted. And so this first photo is just a picture from a program we had on an active logging site. Um, they're getting the logs ready to leave. I might do things such as uh, <clears throat> tree marking for crop tree release. Down here, identifying wildlife scats, so trying to figure out what the, the what wildlife have been around. Um, we do a lot here in Hawking County uh, with hemlock woolly adelgid. Uh, we're one of the few areas in the state that has hemlock trees, so we have ha found it, but every January and February we go out and monitor for the Adelgid and um, Hawking also has a land lab site called Bishop Education Gardens. And we use that for lots of different programs for school groups and things like that. Um, but this is a beautiful time, especially in the fall out at the gardens. Um, too far, sorry. Uh, Hawking Soil and Water is a monarch way station, so we do a lot with the monarch butterflies and pollinators in general. Uh, we help with pollinator plant identification. We also help with um, just insect identification. We have several folks who will bring a, bring a bug in and say, this is, is this going to kill my stuff? And a lot of times it's just a harmless little caterpillar. So we have a lot of education we do regarding that. Um, we have a backyard demo site. That's what this is right here. We have a site here in town that we uh, maintain. We put pollinator plants in there. Um, I think a few years ago we had 13 different species of pollinators that were frequenting this. Um, we also work a lot with uh, the Ohio Pollinator Habitat Initiative and the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund. And um, with OPHI, which is the Ohio Pollinator uh, Habitat Initiative, their motto is um, anything is better than nothing, even a 10 by 10 area. So we we promote small pollinator gardens even in the city. Um, Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund, their motto is plant as much as you can wherever you can. Um, as I said, I help with the equipment rentals. Uh, so we have the ability to plant native warm season grasses, pollinator seed, um, corn, soybeans. So our little planter down here, uh, this is primarily folks who are doing food plots or small pollinator plots. Um, our orange land pride is about a six foot piece of a, a six foot no-till drill to help. It also has the ability to do our uh, pollinators. So um, it can help landowners who have more than five acres. And then we have our 10 foot John Deere, which is generally our wheat and soybeans, our farmers here in the county. Um, and down here in this bottom corner, the bottom right hand corner, we are currently working with the local school district to revamp their land lab um, or their new land lab. They had sold the, the previous one. And so we're working on getting the site prepped to plant a pollinator area on this at this area close to the high school so that students can understand and work with the, the local groups in order to kind of help get pollinators established. <clears throat> Another thing that I do um, are site visits related to pond and stream management. I get a lot of questions related to forest health, um, pond or stream vegetation removal and erosion control. And so just kind of helping folks understand what they can do to make their pond or stream a little bit healthier. <clears throat> we also do a lot of downtown planting. So we help with our, our city as a an American bloom city. So we've been doing a lot of stormwater remediation plantings of trees such as 
um, swamp, uh, uh, swamp white oak, shingle oak. We have some London plane tree that we've planted. So a lot of street trees that are good water, um, water catchers. And we have also started, uh, if you've ever come to Hawking County, there's the great white oak that is in one of our cemeteries. And we have started helping folks to kind of keep on that legacy. Um, this tree is over 650 years old. And so it's kind of a legacy plant here in, here in Logan. And lots of people really respect that. So we've done some work with the seedlings from that. <clears throat> So kind of going on to site visits and focusing on that. Um, usually if I get a call with a plant ID question, I their landowner might it be interested in the, tr the plant or the tree itself or how to manage their lands. Um, a lot of times they're like, oh, how do I do this? And that's like, well, the first thing we're going to do is set up a site visit. So I set up the site visit. We go out. Um, I find that if the landowner has ever heard of the environmental quality incentive program, or if they have questions related to the tax programs for Ohio, um, if so, I bring those supporting documents with me. Uh, but generally, I just go out and I'm kind of trying to feel for, do they understand what the objectives are that they want to uh, do on their property. So a lot of times I will bring this document from NC State. Um, it it kind of fits in for Ohio. We have had to adjust, like tweak some of the questions, but for the most part, it's a very good uh, document. It helps the landowners understand, you know, you don't have to just manage your property to grow trees and sell them. Like you can in, do it for recreation, you can do it for wildlife viewing and things like that. So this document has been very helpful for me. Um, most of my visits are related to forestry and wildlife and how to manage their property for a healthy woodland to help the wildlife. Um, Hawking County is 75% forested. So a lot of people in this county are interested in managing their woodlands. Um, Generally, I ask these two main questions uh, when I'm on a site visit. Uh, what sort of activities do you enjoy doing on your property? What is your, or what is your property primarily used for? Um, and will the land go to a family member, heir, or will it go to some uh, conservation easement program, such as here in Ohio, we have the Ark of Appalachia or the Edge of Appalachia that some people donate property to. Um, so on water districts, property gets donated to. A lot of people don't know the answer to this. They, they don't have any heirs and they're just kind of sitting on their property. So I do try to help them understand that there are programs out there that the folks can do. Um, and then lastly, I am one of five leaders that helps run the Women Owning Woodlands program here in Hocking County. Uh, it, we are known as Southeast Ohio WOW. Um, it was started in, er, WOWnet, the national program was started about 40 years ago and it's in all 40 states. Um, but Southeast Ohio WOW was started in about May of 19. So a pretty new group um, Hawking Soil and Water was asked to start partnering in June. Uh, our leaders are from Central State University, Division of Forestry, OSU Extension, and Rural Action, uh, which is located down here in southeastern Ohio. Uh, we do lots of natural resource programs related, er, lots of natural resource programs to assist primarily women landowners on forest land management. Um, we have partnered with the Ohio Field School to help us get a website. So all of our information and some of the national information is pulled together so that folks who are just learning about women owning woodlands, they have a way of um, 
coming to uh, one centralized location so that they can find those resources for um, like the, the national website and things like that. So we have all those linked together. And um, I just wanted to say thank you to Olivia for asking me to be a part of this and thank you participants for your time and I will turn it back over to Olivia for now. Thanks, Danny. So Danny holds a really great perspective on um, the services that your state can provide. Um, and so as she described, that's a, a really great first stop. Um, so for folks that are not quite sure what resources they have available to them um, or uh, what Olivia, we can't hear you. Can you hear us? I think you've frozen. There was nothing. It might be best to move on. It looks like Zoom booted her out. Well, she might have to come back to I am back. I have no idea why my internet just <laughs> disappeared, but I apologize for that. I am back. Um, so thank you for your patience there. Uh, so I was just saying that a forester like Danny in, at the state level is a great place to start. Um, and so for our next part of our webinar today, we're going to be hearing from Susie Feldman. Um, so Susie, if you want to get ready to start sharing your screen, um, Susie's sharing the perspective of a landowner today. So Susie Feldman is a retired elementary school art teacher uh, with no formal education in forestry, except for having lived on and loved the same piece of wooded land for the last 75 years. Um, in order per, to protect and preserve this land, she and her husband have permanently conserved almost 350 acres and managed their land under a Massachusetts current use tax law. With an eye to the future and education about forests, their land is laced with publicly accessible trails for hikers. So Susie, if you wanna go ahead and share your screen, um, she's gonna share her story about just some of the many things that you as a landowner could do with your land including getting um, the public to enjoy and love it as much as you do. Okay, I can share it. Go for it. Come on, are we there? We are there. Yes, that looks beautiful. <laughs> well, okay, so I'm, thank you very much, Olivia. And I'm pleased to be representing the landowner portion of this group. I am reading also. Although I am sitting at the computer here by myself, my husband Ben and I are equally involved in our forest. He manages the finances and acronyms, any organization with an acronym, while my realm is more woods oriented. I consider what and whether we cut wood, we plan trail maintenance, and I deal with the people it takes to accomplish these tasks. Cutthroat Brook Tree Farm, is in Athol, Massachusetts. It's my family home and it has been since 1947. And I've grown up, as I said, loving this land. This is a picture of the Cutthroat Brook. The name Cutthroat Brook is found on maps dating back to the mid 1800s. And we're told that it refers to the Cutthroat Trout. As far as I know, they don't live here and I've never seen anything more than a minnow, but that's the story. I spent my entire childhood playing in the stream, on the woods and fields, and having a wonderful time growing up with my imagination among the trees and rocks. The mission of our tree farm is to maintain and protect a mixed growth New England forest as naturally as possible, providing habitats for plants, animals, birds, and bugs, as well as enjoyment for the We hope to accomplish this by emphasizing the educational aspect of our forest to encourage people's awareness of the woodland's importance in our lives. My particular passion is for this message to reach children who hopefully will grow up to conserve, own, or protect the forests that remain by the time they're adults. Come on. Okay, whoa. Now I'm stuck. 
Come on. Hmm? I'm going to go back to here. Go to that one. There we go. That's better. I hope that works. Um, in order to explain the gnome hats as these children are exploring the woods, we were once given a garden gnome, which we placed in a woodsy location. He seemed lonely, so we got him a friend. The gnomish population grew by leaps and bounds, and now there are gnomes throughout the whole forest. Kids love to, to track them as they walk on the trails. This is Gnorbert the Gnome. He is about five feet tall and he was carved by a local woodcarver who hunts on our woods. He sits at the entrance to our trails and he's kind of a family mascot protecting all living things as you can see. I need to get rid of my mouse, that's right. In 19, okay, in 1947, my dad bought 40 acres of long abandoned grown over farmland. It had a hunting cabin we used as a summer place, but which soon became our permanent home. As the years went by, my father added to this property in bits and pieces, patchworking them together. We have added, to, we have also added to that as nearby land became available, and now it consists of 350 acres. The major practical use of the land was for firewood, as we have always used, at least mostly, wood heat. Whoop, went too far. Oh, wood, 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 wood heat. Um, beyond that, the woods surrounded us with peace, beauty, and tranquility. The abundance of birds, other wildlife, and plants added further aspects of abstract value, immeasurably enriching our lives. Harvard University owns a large ecological research forest of about 3,000 acres, which abuts our land. Having our access to their incredible faculty, researchers, and staff has helped us to educate ourselves about land stewardship and has ins uh, inspired our mission. Harvard's foresters and scientists have guided us through the stages of becoming a managed forest, providing information and encouragement along our way. We have found them to be a cooperative, helpful big brother in the best kind of way. Over the years, we have participated in numerous of their seminars and other educational opportunities for people whose lives are involved in various ways with woodlands. This is just a picture to look at while we're wandering through the woods here. We have been members of Chapter 61, a Massachusetts-based forest management and tax reduction program since 1980. For that, we must undergo evaluations every 10 years. This involves conferring with a forester to decide what course to, we will follow. Our intent being to maintain a flourishing and healthy natural Northeastern mixed forest, we have usually chosen to do minimal thinnings in smaller areas. Uh, our proposed plan then has to be reviewed and approved both by the town and the state before it can be implemented. We try to find the least intrusive methods possible for harvesting and removal of logs. Wood resulting from the cutting will be sold if possible, and that which remains can be left to, can be left to deteriorate naturally or for feeding the ever hungry woodpile. Deciding to do a conservation restriction was a lengthy and complex process, which probably took us almost 10 years to decide. First, our eventual decision was based on three main factors. First, we felt the need to conserve the land for its benefits to wildlife and the environment, honoring the work that had gone into purposefully assembling the property. We also hope to assemble our land with Harvard Forest and other nearby conservation areas, creating an even larger protected habitat and encouraging neighboring landowners to pursue CRs as well. Lastly, and equally importantly, we have seen land fragmentation divide and sometimes destroy families. We felt it was important to keep the land and the family together. And have, as a result, we have deeded, deeded our, all of our land to one of our sons, equalizing our will in different ways to our two other children. Complicated process, definitely, but we refer to this one son's inheritance as a golden albatross. 
because it is both of great value and a burdensome responsibility. After discussing and interviewing several possible organizations about conservation, we finally decided to work with the local organization, Mount Grace Land Conservation Trust. Finding the balance between conservation and restriction is sometimes difficult and needs to be managed with great care to set up a restriction exactly fitting your needs. As we actually live on our land, we needed to re retain certain relevant conditions in that document. A further complication was that our land is located in three towns. Oop, okay, go work, come back. Try this one. I've lost my, oh, okay. Let's go back to this one. Yes, there it is. It's located in three towns and each town had to, had to agree separately to the restrictions set up in the document. This is the town marker between the three towns. And as you see, he has his own little gnome. And this marker has been in the town of Phillipston. It separates Athol, which is over here, from Petersham. In 1835, this was etched in, and Phillipston on the other side of the town. Mount Grace and Mount Grace's staff worked tirelessly to help us accomplish this. Okay. In 2013, we received a grant from the Wildlife Habitat Improvement Program, a National Resources Conservation Service project. With the consistent input of our spectacular forester, we carefully chose an area, planned its boundaries, object selected some particular trees and clumps to leave intact, and eventually organized a 10 acre cut. It's doing it again. Yep, okay, we'll go back to here. Coming, 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 coming. There. The, a 10 acre cut. Excuse me, just a minute. I lost my place. A, a 10 acre cut designed specifically to create welcoming early successional habitats for birds, animals, and new trees. This is the whip cut. The logger who had been enthusiastically recommended by our forester did the entire job by himself with one skitter and a chainsaw. He was permitted to remove and sell the logwood but left slash on the ground where it would serve as shelter, food and eventually nutrition to the soil. It looked dreadful at first, almost painfully barren, but several years later it has become a thriving baby forest. A bio blitz years later, a few years later, has become, had shown us that many species of birds, insects, and small mammals are now inhabiting it. A few abandoned farm roads on the land were the basis for gathering firewood. While my dad used a 1936 Ford cut down sedan and an ax, we have graduated to utility vehicles and chainsaw and have been able to reach more remote areas. Over the years, we have added many walking and horseback riding trails just for pleasure. Smaller paths naturally developed between all these trails and the labyrinths of aha, meandering ways expanded. This is a hand-drawn map. It's not to exact scale because it doesn't fit the paper if I do it that way, but it gives you the general idea. The pink area in the upper right is our whip cut and the paths are all color coded to match the tree markers I have on the trails. We've developed a good partnership with an active local trail group and they have been exceedingly valuable in helping us manage and maintain trails, especially as we age. They spent a lot of time this winter GPSing the trails and creating a new map, which is geographically accurate, but it's not half so colorful. It turns out that we have developed about 15 miles of trails, all accessible to the public. This summer, one of my grandsons, this is Aiden, spent the summer creating and installing QR codes on a lot of the junctures of the trails. And his work has been very much appreciated by a few wandering explorers out in the woods who suddenly lose track of where they are. In 2018, 
Mount Grace received a U.S. Forest Service grant to bring education into conserved properties. With their assistance, we designed and created a wandering two-mile trail loop through buried areas and designed signage pointing out natural features, tree species, and so forth. We planned the signage to be readable by an eight-year-old, hoping to make it more accessible to families, and have found out that many people enjoy the trail. Okay. On this trail, <laughs> they enjoy that. The learning loop marker is the one with the green arrow on it, and it has a Mount Grace insignia on it. The red one signifies a natural trail. The Q, which means curly Q, it's nothing political. It's, it means, stands for curly Q, but it is a very curly trail designed by a gentleman we know by the name of Curly that meanders throughout the land for a lengthy hike. I like to wood burn all these markers and they're all over the place too. Some of my trees are now beginning to look like, look like porcupines in fancy and in, in areas where trails combine. Another facet of trail management we've been working on with our local trail group is providing easily accessible routes for physically challenged or otherwise limited individuals. We've held our first organized walks with participants using freedom chairs, which are wheelchairs specially designed for off the sidewalk use. And can, I'm gonna go back again. Oh, this is not to this one. For, for off road use. It has, it sort of looks like a trail stroller, but it's very good in going in rough areas. And we've, we're hoping to use, have more opportunities for people to use these in the milder trails. Over the years, we have employed several foresters, some better than others. Most of them have gone on to the further, further adventures in their separate ways. What we've learned is that you must find a person with whom you can converse comfortably about your particular wishes in regard to your forest. You need to be sure that he or she will assist in managing your land in the manner which you find appropriate for your needs. Ask who they have worked for previously. Is this person in the employ of loggers, municipalities, private landowners? Our current consulting forester, with whom we've been working happily for about 20 years, we first hired on a recommendation from our local Department of Public Works. Find a forester who can verify the abilities of loggers if needed and connect you with all other land management professional bleh, land management professionals when necessary. Talk to professional foresters and be sure that they will agree to manage your land in the way most suited to your unique situation, as no two scenarios are exactly the same. Ask questions and expect a thorough, understandable response. Find a person with whom you can consider positives and negatives and evaluate the options before making decisions. Choose your path. Stay involved. Walk with your woods in these professionals. Get out there with them. Feel free to question and make sure you understand. It's up to you to, path, to choose which road you take. Your forester is there to help you with those decisions. And finally, as you establish your network of associates, professionals, and helpful friends, remember to take some time out to breathe deeply, get out there, and enjoy the woods. Thank you very much, Olivia and everyone else. It's been a pleasure to touch on some issues with you, and may your journey take you wonderful places. Thank you, Susie. It is so wonderful to hear your story. And I think there are some comments in the chat of just how impressive it is of all of the work you've done. I think Susie touches on so many aspects of what you can do as a landowner from active management, which again, this webinar next week will touch on to just enjoying your land and having the public on there and creating trails. Um, I've personally gotten to walk Susie's land and I'm not an eight-year-old, but I love the learning loop. I love the gnomes. <laughs> I, I think it's so fun. So um, there's definitely a chance to ask Susie questions at the end of all of her experiences, but I love that both Danny and Susie has thus far touched on you have to be happy with what you're doing with now on your land and you also have to have an eye to the future of who's going to be taking care of that land next. 
Um, so we're going to then transition to our third speaker right now before we get to some questions. Um, and our third speaker is really holding that private consultant perspective in view. So Lori Raskin is joining us from New York. Uh, she's a private consulting forester and started her company DHW Forest Consulting LLC about four years ago. Prior to private consulting, she worked for two sawmills where one role was in the mill and the other was as a procurement forester. While these positions were incredibly valuable to her knowledge and her experience for her career, she found in her heart that private consulting was the route for her. Lori loves helping people reach their goals and objectives for their wooded properties and finds great satisfaction in educating the public about forestry affairs. So Lori, take it away. Hey, thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for having me <clears throat> on this segment. Oh, wow, the screen just changed and all I can see is myself and I'm huge. <laughs> um, okay, so um, as Olivia said, my name is Lori. And uh, before um, we launched our meeting at 1230 today, um, we had um, a pre-meeting you know, with, with the hosts of, of this session. And I was asked to tell everyone um, what DHW stands for. So I'll tell you, um, my grandparents, um, may they rest in peace. Um, they're a very huge integral part of my life um, and my, my career as an individual. You know, They were incredible role models to me. And um, uh, four years ago, when I started my own company, I just said, hmm, I could do, I could make up some names and whatnot, but uh, I wanted to honor them. So DHW stands for Donald and Harriet Wilner. So that in the work that I do, I'm constantly reminded um, of them and um, the legacy that they hold in my life. So, um, so that's DHW Forest Consulting. Um, so I'm a private consulting forester. I roll solo. And um, one day I hope to, you know, um, grow my company to be bigger and have some employees. But, you know, most consulting foresters um, work alone. Um, there are some consulting firms out there like Forcon Inc, for example, and they're all along the East Coast. Um, but I, I, I like doing the private consulting and, and, you know, and managing each segment of what I do, you know, um, specifically tailored and geared towards my clientele. So um, as a private consultant, you know, my job is to be the advocate for the landowner while educating them on forestry practices, um, but tying that into the goals and objectives. And sometimes I work with clients, um, you know, when I say, gee, I have land, but like, and I know I should do something and I wanna do something, but I don't know what. I want to do. So, you know, it's my job to educate them on what is available uh, out there from all different realms and aspects and, and help and formulate goals and objectives, whether you have them or not, and, and move forward from there. Now, that's what a private consultant should do. Um, there's also, you know, there's loggers, there's procurement foresters, there's state foresters. So, you know, and forestry is really the umbrella of it all. So just to talk about the different roles, you know, I just mentioned what I do as a private consultant, but what other private consultants should do for you. A logger is someone who, you know, will, will go in and harvest trees. Now, depending on what state that the logger is from, a logger, um, Nowadays, and especially in New York State, you know, to for a logger to be subbed out by a, a sawmill or, you know, by even myself, for example, I require certain insurances. Um, but now there's like there's loggers training seminars. Um, there's um, continuing education credits that they can they can get. So you know, 20 years ago, it was just you know willy nilly. Um, you know, you'd go and you'd cut, cut the kind of trees that you want and then, you know, leave the forest. Um, that, that's known as high grading in the field of forestry. And high grading is like basically cherry picking the best of the best quality of timber for production of forest-based ecosystem goods and services, and then leaving the unacceptable growing stock behind. Well, what does that mean for us? So unacceptable growing stock maybe are those trees that wouldn't be viable for timber. But at the end of the day, you know, wildlife doesn't care if a tree is tall and straight and beautiful and can produce hardwood floors or veneer products, you know, as long as it's still producing a viable seed source, et cetera. But in any event, so foresters and loggers, you know, they do have some training, um, or I'm sorry, loggers have training um, 
with continuing education credits and how to proper employ forestry regi regimes to the landscape. But, you know, a forester should have um, a, a degree from accredited college uh, or organization or licensing and certification. Now, a procurement forester is one that specifically works for a sawmill procurement. They're procuring wood. So a lot of times, and from me being working as a procurement forester myself at one point, you know, um, I was able to just write a check to somebody and say, yep, I can offer you this for your wood. I would talk to landowners about their goals and objectives. But, you know, a lot of landowners who were interested in selling their timber, you know, they were interested in filling their pocket. And that's not a negative statement, you know, that, you know, maybe they have a child or a family member that's sick, or they want to send their kids off to college or something like that. So they see that their wood can pay for that. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so while I, you know, tried very hard not to uh, completely annihilate the woods of acceptable growing stock, you know, at the end of the day, that's a sawmill's goal. I know a lot of procurement foresters who try very hard when a landowner says, oh, just take everything worth something, you know, it's like, all right, we'll try to leave something behind here to be a little more environmentally conscious. But, um, you know, their goal is to, is to feed the mill. So, um, Anyway, so that's some differences between other like foresters and loggers. Um, a state forester, at least I can say in New York State, like with the Department of Environmental Conservation, a lot of landowners will call the New York State DEC, um, and I'm sure some landowners in other states will call um, a state forestry agency and inquire about their land. Now, I can't speak for other states, but at least in New York, the DEC, you know, they will talk to landowner, private landowners about their forested acres, but when it comes time to employ any sort of management regime, the state cannot do that. So there's a list that you have to be qualified and maintain continuing ed education credits to be on. It's called the New York State DEC Cooperating Foresters List, which I'm on. And so um, they'll refer at least, you know, depending on the landowner's area uh, and where, where they live and where the foresters that are on the list will work, they'll refer, hey, you could look at this list or, you know, what have you, and then you know, a private consultant would help them. But it's good and I would recommend that if you own, you know, private land and you're not quite sure what direction you wanna go and maybe you're not ready to speak with a private consultant just yet, getting a good base foundation about what, what is out there in terms of availability of consultants and even programming that the state offers or the federal government offers like NRCS, Danny mentioned that before, um, you know, is a great foundation to get your feet wet and arm you with perhaps a list of things that you can inquire about when you do decide or if you decide to talk to a private consulting forester. So now that, that can tie right into what the importance is for hiring a private consultant. As I said in the beginning, you know, we are your agent to help you get to your goals and objectives. So some of the things that I do, and I always make sure to do for my clients, whether I'm talking to them for the first time on the phone or through the process, you know, and get really getting to learn. And like Susie said, you know, what your forester should really be in tune with or try to, you know, jive with what you're looking to get out of your property. Um, and you know, I always try to educate people about what, what services I can employ. And then if they're willing to do so, sometimes like the NRCS, for example, um, they offer a program called EQIP. It's the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. And it's not just for New York State. And so the NRCS will pay for a forest management plan that's called a CAP 106. The CAP 106 plan has to have a whole mess of criterion um, that your forester can write, but this, once it's approved as a CAP 106, there are funding opportunities because forestry is considered under, you know, the agricultural umbrella. So if your property, whether you need help, um, you know, maintaining or creating an apple orchard or using best management practices, which a side note, best management practices are ways that we can employ forest regimes to a landscape to mitigate from soil erosion and sedimentation. But a lot of these activities can be quite costly. And then if there isn't timber on your property to help offset the costs, there are cost sharing opportunities available that your forester should educate you about. 
after you have a conversation with your with a with your with a forester or a potential forester, you know, it's important that if you consider moving forward, I highly recommend to ask them if they don't offer it if they have a service agreement so that there can be some form of, a, you know, a contract between the forester and the landowner. So this way you can compare apples to apples, you know, what actual service am I getting from you or from me for that matter, you know, and, and what are the costs associated with that? You know, some, if you, for timber sale administration, for example, I don't know about in other states, but in New York, it's very common for private consultants to charge 15% commission of a timber sale or an hourly rate. You know, um, generally an average hourly going rate amongst my colleagues is about $75 per hour. Um, and so that's not uncommon. And I'm just letting you all know this because I think it's important for you guys to get, or, or gals, you know, to get a scope of, you know, what to expect or anticipate. There's a, I'm a private consultant in my, in my neck of the woods that will charge $125 an hour. That's a lot of money <laughs> per hour, but, you know, it depends on, on what the scope of the project is and how much they have to do. So in addition to your forester, make, making sure that your forester can provide you with a service agreement that, that says something about their level of professionalism and the quality of work that you can anticipate that they're gonna put forth. You know, it's one thing if you know someone and you wanna do a handshake deal, but you know, a lot of times and unfortunately a handshake deal, you know, um, if you're not 100% educated on what your forester can do for you and it's not documented and then they start doing something else, which I've seen happen before, you know, then what happens? How much time investment and money investment have you already made? And are you gonna be hit with a bill for something? Um, in addition to your forester having a service agreement for you, if there is any timber sale administration or timber stand improvement, that's called a TSI. So a TSI would be a situation where it's like, well, your forest, you know, it was high graded 20 years ago and it didn't really grow back very well because the seed stock wasn't that great. So we need to do a timber stand improvement um, to cut trees, maybe for firewood. Well, a logger is not necessarily gonna, you know, come in just for firewood. There needs to be a little bit of an incentive, hence the cost sharing programs, but whatever avenue that you can tap into financially to have uh, your forester help you manage something for your woodlot where it entails having a subcontractor come in, like a logger, for example, it's very important that you have a forest products agreement, again, whether for timber or pulpwood or doing a clear cut, building a landing, whatever the case may be, you should make sure that your forester has a forest products agreement or a contract between the buyer and the, buyer and the seller. You're the seller, the buyer is the, the logger or the sawmill or what have you, because that is going to protect you in case the third party involved, the buyer, you know, ends up, you know, doing something outside of the norm or, you know, you, you say, hey, look, I don't want you here between these windows or hours. Well, the contract should say that. In addition to that, whether you're working um, with a sawmill, a logger, a private consulting forester, anytime that you're inviting somebody on your property, it's important to consider um, insurance. You know, does I carry insurance? And I always say in my service agreements, you know, live my in, insurance can be furnished upon request. And also making my clients sometimes they request additionally insured. Well, what does that mean? So say I'm on your property, I'm marking a timber sale, uh, a log uh, or a limb comes and falls on my head and I, you know, have all these doctor bills. Well, if you're not additionally insured on my insurance, which that's what my insurance should cover, you know, someone can come after you and say, oh, I got hurt on your property and I was on your property, therefore I'm coming after you. We might have lost Lori for a second. Hopefully she'll come back. <laughs> we'll just patiently wait to see if she does. I noticed while we wait for Lori to return, um, I noticed there are some in the information in the chat about uh, just the different state level program. So Danny mentioned that Ohio has a master loggers program. So again, forgetting you're making sure the loggers are continuing their education. 
Um, there's also, Jennifer mentioned that the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources um, have foresters who are dedicated to working with woodland owners. So we have a variety of folks here today. Susie's from Massachusetts, but our professionals are from Ohio and New York. Um, so each state is gonna be a little bit different and the acronyms might be a little bit different, but there's always gonna be someone at the state level that can provide you some free guidance um, like Danny does. And then there's those uh, private consulting foresters that like Lori was explaining, um, work for themselves and therefore provide um, or charge a fee because they're not getting taxpayer dollars to pay for that uh, support that they can offer. One thing um, Ohio has, it's called the Timber Harvest Plan. It's a voluntary program. And it's something that we encourage landowners, foresters and loggers to um, fill out. And it, Lori kind of touched on this just a little bit, but it is, um, it's to help make sure everybody's going to follow to the best of their abilities, best management practices on a harvest situation or some sort of forestry practice um, that is going to disturb soil. And so by doing that, if something should happen and soil gets into the waters of the state, they are, she's back. <laughs> they will be able to help lessen the liability and if somebody were to get sued or whatnot, so. Lori, welcome back. We were just talking about some of the differences um, that could happen between states and some of the individual programs that uh, happen at a state level. So continue on okay. what you're talking about. Welcome back. Sorry, this has never happened before. So I don't know if Mercury's in retrograde or something and technology's like crazy or whatever, but where, where did I, where, what was the last part that you guys heard? You were talking about um, agreements between loggers um, and insurance and how you often carry insurance. Okay. You called it the forest products agreement. And I said that Ohio has something I think might be somewhat simple, similar. It's uh, called the timber harvest plan, but it's related to best management practices. So, sure. okay. So I, I said a bunch after that. <laughs> um, okay. So um, did we talk about being, a, making sure that your forest or did you hear me talk about um, that your, 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 your forester should make sure that if you have um, any sort of contract to sell or you know buy timber between the landowner, the, the seller and the buyer, that the buyer should make sure that you're additionally insured. Did we talk about that? Okay. So the importance of being additionally insured is that if someone gets hurt on your property, that that insurance is going to cover and take care of, of them and they're not gonna come after you. So those are just some examples as you know, landowners, you know, to keep in your wheelhouse, keep, keep those things close to your vest, because if anyone that you consider working with doesn't offer that, or they try to shy you away from it, or, oh no, it's okay, or whatever, you know, like, then that's a red flag. Um, there are some foresters that do call themselves private consulting foresters, but they're like industrial foresters. Well, what does that mean? They are looking to prey on landowners that have timber. They'll promise you the world, say they're gonna do this, that, and the other thing. They'll go mark a timber sale and they'll end up doing a high grade because they know they want, you know, maybe a particular tree species is doing really well in the market. So they're gonna mark the best of the best, you know, and say, oh yeah, I did this and that because they know that you're not 100% knowledgeable about it. Um, and just, and, and go for it. And, but they look like a hero because, you know, you may be in need of money, you know? So it's like, oh yeah, I'm getting a hundred thousand dollars for my timber sale. Like my forester is the best, but then they'll tell you, oh, we could do this again in 15 years. Well, I can't tell you how many times I've picked up after other private consultant consulting foresters work and I read their management plans and the landowner tells me what was in the work schedule, what's been done and how they were promised another harvest in 15 years, et cetera. And I go into the woods and I'm like, uh, there's nothing to harvest or, and they get mad at the landowners, which I don't blame them. They get mad at me because, um, you know, I'm telling them something different than what their forester told them, but Hey, guess what? There's a reason why that they don't work for them anymore or they kept promising one thing or another. There's another private consulting forester in my area where you know this happened and the 
the landowner told me that the forester said, oh, we'll just call a logger and tell them to go in there and take whatever they want. Now this property was enrolled in what's called the New York State Forest Tax Law 480A. So there are, and this, this if any of you live in New York or, or have people or have friends or family that live in New York, this the forest tax law, you need 50 contiguous acres of forested land and there's potential that you can save up to 80% on your taxes, that's school and county combined. So I help pe get people enrolled in this program. There are a lot of caveats to the law, but because the DEC and some and most state agencies are generally understaffed, you know, a lot of things go by the wayside. So private consulting foresters learn that and they're like, oh, you know, like I can let that fly under the radar. So it's very important that, you know, the point I'm making here is that, and I don't mean to sound negative, make sure like you just like have a little checklist for yourself. Make sure that the person you're speaking with, you know, to help you manage your forested land is, is engaged attentive, pays attention to what you're saying, doesn't try to derail you from what you think you want or to convince you otherwise. Make sure that they're um, educated, have their credentials, make sure that they offer you a service agreement. Not all, not all do, but at the end of the day, you know, it protects me and it protects you. Um, you know, and also says you can terminate this at any time, you know, um, just so you don't, you're not locked in. Um, and make sure that there's insurances and contracts. And um, so that's what I would say about um, things to always pay attention to that your forester um, should provide you. Um, that's part, just part of the service, um, you know, and, and a lot of times foresters will also, not only are we in the woods and, and, and managing the landscape for your goals and objectives, but many things that we do also, you know, I'll always make sure that I do deed research for any of my clients, you know, when they say, oh, I own the property or, you know, I'm like, oh, okay, do you know what the section lot and block number is for your property? And, you know, I look up to make sure that they own it. Um, and I'm not saying any of you are dishonest, but you know, some people can get hard up for cash and they look to claim stake on their neighbor's property and then sell it to the forester or the procurement forester or that industrial forester, you know, oh yeah, I own this, go ahead, you know? Um, and then, so it's like in making sure that the person who owns the property says that they own the property. Another thing to consider is that, um, you know, if there's a mortgage or a lien on the property, I even look into that too. Because if we do a timber sale, some landowners don't remember or realize that their mortgage or a lien on the property has particular language in, language in it with stipulations that say any, any revenue that's generated from the property must go to the bank. So it's my responsibility to do that research and make sure that you're covered. So, you know, your forester should really, you know, have a large wheelhouse of um, expertise and know-how to make sure that they're crossing their T's and dotting their I's appropriately. And it's for them, you know, I do it for me, but I also, I do it for you because, you know, your forester and, and me just speaking personally on my own, like, I want what's the best for you. How could we make money? How could we save money? How could everyone put bread on their table? Do it legitimately, do it ecologically, do it while it's ecologically sound, socially acceptable and financially feasible. You know, um, <clears throat> I also always make sure and make sure that your forester does this too, or, or it's a question that you can, again, put in your wheelhouse or keep close to your vest that, you know, are there any rare, threatened or endangered species on the property? You know, how do you find that out? Well, you go to the state, you know, you go to someone like Danny who can look in their database and find out what's going on. You know, um, there are some rare, threatened and endangered species where you know, they, they hibernate at certain times of the year and then they're active at certain times of the year. So you cannot like the Northern long-eared bat, for example, that's an endangered species, especially in my area. Um, you know, um, there's also, and you cannot harvest between uh, November 1st and March 31st. You are not allowed to harvest because these bats like to nest under, you know, tree, under the bark of trees. Um, so if we're going to cut timber, you know, and disrupt the potential for the species to rehabilitate its population, what are we doing? So making sure that your forester is not only complying with and helping you reach your goals and objectives, but also making sure that you're following local and state ordinances. Sometimes local ordinances and municipalities have a timber harvesting permit. 
neighbors, whether you're friendly with them or not, if they notice or someone drives by and sees a timber sale going on and they're an environmentalist, you know, they may call the local municipality and say, hey, so-and-so is having a timber harvest on this property. Did you know that? And the clerk will look, you know, that the town clerk will look in their files to see if there was a, a timber harvesting permit, you know, that was granted. And if it wasn't, well, who's going to guess who's going to get in trouble? You, not the forester, not the logger, but this, this will create a lawsuit you know, and a headache that you don't need. So making sure that you have the goals and objectives set forth, the proper contracts and service agreements that local and state ordinances are being adhered to and that due diligence is being paid uh, and that everyone works together is very important. I, I may be making it sound like I work, you know, by myself and I do, but I'm, there's a whole network um, and ecological food web, so to speak, of how we all work together and how your forester should work with you. I constantly work with state foresters. I'm always making sure that I'm getting the, the proper letter um, certifications and letters so that when I do prepare a timber harvesting permit for a local municipality, that I'm crossing all my T's and dotting my I's. You know, sure, it's professional for me to do that, but really it's in the best interest for you. So. Um, that's how all of us, you know, work together um, and, and should work together at all times. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lori. It's so good to hear your perspective. And um, I'm going to switch it so we can see all of our speakers right now. Um, so we are going to go into some um, question and answer section. So we have a bunch of different <laughs> perspectives here. Uh, we have a state forester. We have um, a private forester, we have a landowner, um, and they all have their different like aspects they can share. I know there was already one question in the chat from Roberta a while ago for Susie. So Susie, I'm going to start with you here and then we'll see um, what else is going on. But Roberta asked Susie, how do you keep ATVs off of your trails? That's a very difficult one. We have so much land that you, we can't tell where they are. I know people get out there occasionally. Our CR does not allow them. I, we state no motors. And occasionally someone is out there, but we haven't had any problems with them. Um, we use an ATV in our own forestry a little bit, but it's, a, it's strictly a forestry. It's used as, as it should be, not as a sporting thing. I have not found a successful way to put gates up or anything like that, and I don't want to do that. I think you just kind of have to get the word out and deal with people's hopeful honesty. Sorry. <laughs> I'd like to add to that, if you don't mind. Um, you know, I don't know, Susie, if your property is posted, um, the boundary lines, but boundary line maintenance is very important. Those mm -hmm. posts, I don't know about in other states, but I know in New York State, you know, um, it's advisable to post your boundary lines about every, you know, 50 to 75 feet because if yeah, someone- We do have signs out there. There are several roads and it's in a very back area. So there are lots of places that connect with other roads that are not connected to public roads. Several large wooded areas together and everybody has a slightly different point of view on that. But yes, we do and try to keep it marked. And yeah, Regine in the chat just said yeah. putting up game cameras can also be a good way to monitor unauthorized oh. use. And I see Danny okay. nodding yeah. her head. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and to add to that, sometimes I tell my clients, look, if you can't afford game cams or you don't have the time for it, at least if I'm going to post your boundary lines for you or if you're going to do it yourself, there's nothing wrong with that entry points to get those smile you're on camera, post that on a tree, even if there isn't camera usage. <laughs> You know, it gets yeah. the message, oh, let me get out of here. So. Yeah. I think Starlet, this is a hot topic right now. Starlet in the chat just said, but how do you enforce? And I think that is the problem. I talked with a landowner um, in a different part of Massachusetts that tried to go to their local police um, and just found it really difficult to actually follow through with any type of enforcement. So if, if anyone else in the chat or in this Zoom call has thoughts, feel free to either unmute or um, type that in the chat. But we have another question. I can kind oh, of jump go for in it, on that really yeah. quick. Um, at least in Ohio, oh, <clears throat> excuse me, in Ohio, 
if it is posted no trespassing and then you have a game uh you are able to catch the license plate number or something like that on line um or on the camera they can then do something um there are a handful of states and ohio is not quite there but there's what's called the purple paint law um, I know it's really big out West. Uh, the purple paint law, what that does is it is in, it is pretty much your no trespassing. Um, if your state has adopted that law, you are required to adhere to the no trespassing because the purple paint uh, means no trespassing in California and some of the other states. So, and I know Ohio is thinking of doing that and we're in the process of trying to. Um, I see Roberta has her hand up. So I was the one who asked the question initially. I own property where somebody was using their ATV and actually built a bridge across the stream. And uh, yeah, I mean, they were trails all over the place and they built a bridge across the stream and all kinds of stuff. I finally put up signs that said, I'm not liable for any of this because I didn't yeah. do it. And if you built it, please contact me. It turned out Anna Butter was, con was doing it and thought it was their land. Um, but in Massachusetts, um, if you're on someone else's property in a motorized vehicle, you actually have to have on your person written permission to be on that property. That's the law. Doesn't mean they follow it, but that's the law. Yeah. I think for us, since we've opened the land to the public, we've had fewer. We used to have a fair number of people with ATVs on. But since the land is open to the public and we're apt to have kids and dogs and things like that on the trails, it has gone down somewhat. I haven't seen any much activity lately, certainly. You probably have a lot more, since you have so many more eyes out there, that definitely helps. Yes, and the possibility of running into someone you don't intend to. Lucy, we have another question for you, um, just thinking about controlling invasives on your property. Do you have like a boot brush or anything to prevent little seeds or bits of invasives coming onto your property? Or have you just thought about invasives with your forester at all? We have talked about it. I don't think we've got any invasives. I'm, I'm talking to my other half back here at the same time. <laughs> uh, We've talked to him about it and he has not found anything. But uh, I, when you say, boot, you think people should brush off their boots before they come on or is that what you're saying? Come that on and leave. Some kind of a boot bath or something of that nature. Good point. I, I have, it's not something I had considered. Susie, I will say a lot of the um, national forests have what's called a boot brush. And it's, it kind of goes up, it's a, it's a brush on the bottom and then on either side so that people it's can snow. clear their boots yeah, off. No, yeah. And just yep. suggest that you brush off before and after. Yep. Good point. I'll consider that one. I will take that one to heart. That sounds interesting. Awesome. And we have a question for Danny. Do you have any tips or thoughts on pond management? <laughs> veering a little bit from forestry and into well, ponds. So my best recommendation is going to be call your local soil and water or local, um, our division of forestry has a um, fish management division uh, in it, or I said division of forestry, division of wildlife, excuse me, has a fish management division. And I would encourage contacting them because it's so hard to say yes. It kind of what Lori was saying earlier, everybody is different. So without seeing what's going on, without knowing whether this is a constructed pond, a natural pond, whether this is uh, has acid mine drainage, there's just so many things that can go into this. Um, so I would recommend you contacting your local agency and they can help guide you to the answer for that. And uh, one thing I did forget to mention earlier, um, I, I do, speaking with uh, Lori and things like that, when I'm on a site visit, I do let the landowners know, you know, there are state service foresters, there are consulting foresters. So I'm kind of like the, the middleman, like I go and look at it and give them an idea of which direction they need to go. And then I'm like, okay, you need to discuss this. You need to contact one of these 
consulting foresters and you need to, if it's the Ohio forest tax law, contact your local service forester in order to get the ball rolling on that. So I kind of start the, start the ball rolling, but then guide them to the correct uh, professional that they need to work with. Yeah, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Manage it. And our goals need to be SMART, which is an acronym, sustainable, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. So it's very important to consider um, when you're asking questions or if you get a little frustrated that someone may not be able to answer a question that you have about your property right away, well, we've got to see it, you know? And Susie mentioned this, that they've had a number of foresters and, and most of those have been just because that forester has moved on to other things in their life. But um, Lori mentioned this as well. It's find someone that you want to talk to and that you can really have a conversation with and that you can build a relationship and, and trust with. I think Susie and Ben have found someone that's really worked well for their property and listened to their goals. And, you know, they've done everything from from the learning loop to doing these uh, like federal level wildlife programs too. So I find when I go, when my forester comes up to evaluate, he goes through and he marks everything that he wants to mark. And then I go through with him and he marks something. And say, nope, can't have that one. I like that tree. It may be a garbage tree, but it has a story and it has its personality. And I like it because it's cute <laughs> or something awesome. like that. And we, we talk back and forth. We, maybe he'll swap for something else. Maybe he agree, agrees with what I'm saying, but it's back and forth. And eventually we come to an agreement. But well, Susie, I'm glad that you pointed that out because that is one thing, even if I'm doing a crop tree release, you as the landowner have the ultimate last say in anything. So if there is a tree, you are, I mean, you, you grew up swinging on this swing yeah. in this tree like you have the right to say no you cannot have that tree yeah so i'm glad that you pointed that out thank you i also like that Susie during her talk um talked about the whip cut that they did mm -hmm. which was about 10 acres and and you know Susie mentioned wow it looked awful to begin with and and being able to talk with your forester and have them explain, you know, it might look really bad at first or look just shocking to you, not necessarily bad. And then for Susie to be on the land long enough to see that transition back to a forest um, is really special. I'm the grandmother of the group. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sherry has a question that probably Lori and Danny could help answer. Um, she says, I have 50 acres of mature loblolly pine that are mature and need to be harvested. I would like to reforest with hardwoods. Any recommendations? Again, I'm going to go back to find a local professional because I don't work with loblolly in Ohio. Uh, we have started allowing folks to start planting it, but it's going to boil down to what's good in your area, native species, soil regime and all sorts of things. So uh, find a local professional is gonna be my guidance. Where is this property located again? Where is the Loblolly Pine? Sherry, feel free to unmute it's yourself in Virginia. if you want. It's in the, oh, yeah, Virginia. I just did. It's a Piedmont, Piedmont region of um, Virginia. Okay. Central well, Virginia. It's a typically loblolly pine forests are planted, so I presume it's a it's a plantation style situation. So mm -hmm. if there is a market in your area for loblolly, um, and it's nice and tall and straight, and it's self pruned properly, and it's free and clear of limbs, you know, it could it could be sold for telephone poles. And if you want to replant, you know, just like Danny said, you're you're absolutely going to want you know uh, to maybe get a soil uh, test done. Um, um, through, uh, there's a web soil survey um, that's free to everybody, you know, and you can look up your area, create an area of interest, and it'll produce um, a soil map uh, for your area uh, and, or even just your property, um, if you, if you look at that. And then you're a local um, soil and water conservation district. They should be able to help you with that. So once you learn the type of soil that you have, um, your soil depth, the, the slope, you know, that, that it's facing. I don't know if your property's flat, like typically timber 
you know, or, or, or trees grow better on a northeast facing slope because it's not exposed to the sun as much. So, um, you know, it gets just enough sun and then there's enough shade and moisture retention available to help trees grow and any vegetation for that matter on a south or southwest facing slope you've got, you know, it's exposed to sun, like a little too much sun so it may not grow as 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 um, as readily as you know, another tree species so suiting the, the soil, the type, the depth, your slope aspect and ratio will determine the most suitable tree species for you. And then you'd have to talk to a professional about, you know, what trees to purchase and how, um, and how many, what size, you know, you you'll have to protect hardwoods from deer disturbance. You might have to tube them. You might have to completely do a deer fence around the area, which NRCS, if you have the proper management plan can help offset those costs. So hope that answers the question. Awesome. So, and, so I think you're getting confused with the long, the but the long leaf pine. They use that one, I know, for poles. For the loblolly, it's pulp. It's it's just a paper. So, so that's one thing. I I I already um I just I just had 600 hardwoods planted on pasture land, mm -hmm. um, and so that had its own special um, procedures and difficulties. But I was wondering yeah. with a, a forested area, especially a forest that doesn't enable other trees to grow, if there was anything special to do with the land following loblolly plantings? Um, like Lori said, the biggest thing's gonna be to get that soil test because pines in general make your soil very acidic. Um, and by checking that soil type, you may have to lime or fertilize the area so that it makes it okay or better suitable for other hard for other species and hardwoods, but um, someone in your local area would be able to help guide you on that recommendation and help you with understanding how much lime or fertilizer you may or may not need. Also, someone before the loblolly pine subject had I just saw in the messages had said, uh, "What was the what's the deal with the northern longeared bat?" Now I know in New York, you um, if your property is coined to be um, habitat um, or within the radius of habitat for the Northern Long-Eared Bat, you are not allowed to harvest timber between November 1st and March 31st. So through that window is when no timber harvesting or really alter, altering the landscape and cutting trees down shouldn't happen because that's when, that's the breeding and um, it's the breeding season and hibernation season for these bats. Like in Ohio, um, our biggest thing, we don't have a law against private landowners logging and things, but if they are working with a federal program, um, if they're trying to get a harvest done between April and October, uh, it is and through uh, natural resource conservation funds and things like that, it is absolutely not allowed to have a harvest in that time frame because of roosting and whatnot. Um, for the Indiana bat and the, the little brown bat, so. Thanks for catching that question from Jessica in the chat. That was great. I did and see a question from Roberta. Is that the one you're getting ready to do? Go for it. Uh, okay. She says, how would a boot bath keep the birds from spreading seeds? The boot bath doesn't help with anything. The only way, kind of like the, the birds spreading hemlock woolly adelgid. The only way to do that is the stinky part is get rid of all the birds. So it's not going to happen, obviously. Um, so you can, you're just trying, you as the person are trying to reduce your footprint. And that's what the boot, the boot bath, the boot brush, things like that does. And there's lots of good stuff going on in the chat. People have been putting um, links to the, the soil survey pages and, and other perspectives from around the country, which are great. Susie, I'm gonna keep asking you questions because I, I just think your perspective is so great as a landowner. And I know we've had this question for you before, but in terms of opening up your land to the public, um, is there anything that you've had to keep in mind or have you and Ben had any additional insurance or speaking of like, Lori was talking about liability and insurance. Um, yeah, Starlet Henderson just asked, does Susie carry insurance? How do you make it work on your end to feel good about letting anyone come and use your property? 
the insurance question, I, if I can allow a man to speak, I can do that. <laughs> you can definitely let Ben you talk have, if you want. I know we have some, but how it goes about that, I don't know. I will tell you, though, that it has been an exceedingly rewarding experience to do this. Especially this year, because we live in a, in a town where a lot of people don't have a lot of other places to go. We've had sometimes a dozen or more cars parked in our field on a day with kids and dogs, and especially with the COVID crisis. It has provided them with something absolutely unreplaceable. It's, it's, it's been a marvelous experience. Do you want to ask about insurance? Ben, do you want to say something about insurance? About insurance. Stick your head over here. <laughs> this, pardon me, this is a guy. <laughs> hey, guy. <Mine. laughs> well, Outside of there, as part of our conservation restriction, and actually the uh, executive director of uh, Mount Grace is actually listening to this uh, program at the moment. I can see your name. Hi, Emma. First, you got to understand, I'm from New Jersey. In New Jersey, you don't let anybody on your property. So That's why it took us 10, 10 years. years. It took <laughs> us a long time to figure out how to do this. And we finally ended up doing it because Susie was a teacher. And the person who was doing conservation, uh, preservation for Mount Grace Land Trust, Susie had in school from kindergarten to grade six. So The advantages of a small town are wonderful that way. That's right. So you had a, a, a a level of confidence in them. Uh, we ended up selling our conservation restriction as part of the landscape partnership, which meant that the state said, yes, we'll pay you for this, but you must allow people on your land. But there's a difference between allowing and welcoming. Right. So we have to allow them on the land. We make it I really, go, come on, come on, come on, come on. We make it easy for them. <laughs> But you only have to allow. There's also some chapter 28, or I think of blah, 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 the state laws. It says that basically, if you're walking on someone's land and you're not being charged for the privilege, then you can't be exactly be responsible if a tree should happen to fall upon them. In addition, I also increased our liability insurance to a million dollars, just in case. So that's the, that's the. Thanks, Ben, for that. <laughs> He's wonderful. I couldn't do it. <laughs> I can't deal with that stuff. <laughs> so there's so many people to dogs. <laughs> there's so many people to support you making your decisions, whether it's your family circle, this like state level resources, your private the, resources. It, it takes a network. We've all, we've all said that. Everybody needs to refer to someone else and listen to other opinions. It's, it, it's a whole network, a spider web. Awesome. And I think on, on that note, I'm going to thank our speakers. So thank you, Susie, Danny, and Lori. Um, it's so great to hear your perspectives. I just dropped into the uh, chat a evaluation form for our webinar today. So if you wouldn't mind filling that out, like I said at the beginning, there's two more sessions coming up the following Wednesdays. Next week, we'll dive even more into active stewardship. And then the last session, we'll talk about um, creating a plan for your woodland. So do fill out that evaluation form. Um, and please help me thank Susie, Danny, and Lori for their time and their insights and wonderful experiences. So thank you guys. Wonderful to work with you all. Yeah, was well, very fun. Yeah. Good luck, everyone. Thanks. And I guess.